Okay, Bob. Just a few data points. We're recording now. I'm Larry Parsons. We're in Manhattan, Kansas, and it's the 28th of August of 2003. Yes, sir. Right. And uh, if you'll get us started by stating your full name and your birth date, maybe where you're born. Okay. I'm Robert uh, E. Hetzler. I was born in Onega, Kansas, and uh, grew up in there. Went to school and everything until the war started, World War II. Uh, my parents had uh, moved to Junction at that time so he could work at Fort Riley. And I was going to school in my senior year. I had uh, joined, or what was it, when we went into the aviation cadet program, because my two older brothers had already enlisted in the Air Force and were both pilots. And by the time I got in, of course, they had so many that they uh, really didn't need me. So then I got inducted at Fort Leavenworth. What year was that? Uh, it was in uh, Pearl Harbor Day. On the, or no, that's my birthday. Uh, in November of 43. Okay. And, and this was how long after you graduated from high school? Well, I didn't graduate, really. I, this is a bad mark on me because I was, I was behind in my grades. I flunked a couple of years in grade school way back in third and fourth grade or something. So I was 18 by the time before I graduated, and this is one reason that I had to go in. Uh, and I was helping my uh, uncle up their farm and had a farm deferment, but they found out that uh, I was going to school for half a day and only farming, so they said either do one or the both. So I went ahead and volunteered to go in. And uh, we got inducted at Fort Leavenworth, and we went to uh, Amarillo Air Force Base, Texas, for my basic training. I remember one incident there where we had a big blizzard when nothing was moving in or out of the city at the time. After my basic, I... Uh, what, let's t oh. be a little more specific about your basic training. What kind of activities and well, what were the living conditions like? And, uh, uh, they, we lived in a barracks. We had a... Uh, we, uh, it was kind of, there were three groups of us at three different barracks. Two of the barracks had brothers that were uh, PFCs, I remember. <laughs> and they were really uh, specific about their training. Well, we had an old buck sergeant that had gotten busted from something, <laughs> and he was a little bit more lax, so we had a little bit more fun in our training. And uh, we took, uh, well, we took a, a rifle training and so forth. We went out on back, lived in tents and so forth, and uh, done our uh, PTA, PT training all and so forth, and uh, let's see, that's about all. That's also where we took the test to see whether we be could become pilots, and that's where they give us all kinds of coordination tests and so forth and like that, and of course we uh, flunked out of that because it was really difficult. And uh, so then you had a choice of either going into armament radio or uh, mechanics. Well, I was mechanically inclined, so this is what I picked. And after basic, well, that's about it on basic, they sent us to Salt Lake City to get reassigned, and they assigned me to the Empire Air Force Base in Texas. And at that time, before sending you to mechanic school, they decided they could send you right out on the line and you could work with experienced people and learn more than you did if you went to school, or learn better, I guess, or maybe it was more economical. And there we were, I was in the division where we changed engines on the B-17s. So uh, while I was down there, I got to thinking one day, my two brothers was both flying, and I kind of like to fly, and you get 50% more pay. So I applied for gunnery school and was accepted, and uh, they sent me then to uh, Kingman Air Force Base in Kingman, Arizona, and there where was an incident where we played softball and so forth in the evening, and one day when we go up to fly and practice, uh, we had cameras in our guns for guns, and they would send a fighter plane from another base over there to fly uh, what they called uh, well, we would fly along, and in those days, the fighters would fly out here, then they would approach and shoot at you, the enemy. 
And uh, this one, we was in a three-plane formation, and I was in the lead plane in the tail gunner's position that day when this fighter mistaken it, and he came clear over here and hit the wing on one of the bombers behind me, and they both went in and, and crashed, and they all perished. And I think at that time, if they would have said, well, do you want to fly? I think maybe I would have quit. <laughs> but I didn't. And I just remember, you know, we played softball with them guys that night and everything, or the night before, and uh, so that was quite an experience. What kind of airplane were you flying? It was a V-17. Okay. The same, the same B-17s that uh, you worked on the engines on. Yes, that's right. And I didn't realize then, you know, what a... I call it a beautiful airplane in those days. It was a good airplane. And uh, another incident up there when we first started flying, I'd never flown before. Well, I remember this old tough sergeant, he said, now we're going to go up there. Anybody gets sick, you go to the bomb bay and do your job, and when you get down on the ground, you're going to clean it up. And I vowed that then, by golly, I never was going to get air sick, <laughs> and I never did. And so that was a good experience. Anyway, after we graduated from gunnery, uh, then they sent me to uh, a MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. And here where they gathered us as a crew, we had 10 men and all, and we all went out on the same plane, not the same plane, but the same crew every day and practiced and fired our gun with real live ammunition and everything. And there was another incident, too. One day we flew the old Memphis Bell. Do you all remember that? It had retired. It had flew his 25 missions, come back, and he had it on a tour to sell war bonds. And we got to fly in it one day. And I remember it was, it was an older type plane, had different equipment on it and everything. And uh, I didn't realize at the time, you know, what kind of a significance that was to me, really. So... Uh, after we had I don't know, spent, and this was another thing, here he was in Florida in the middle of winter, January to March, and this old farm boy from this cold Kansas town couldn't believe you could run around in shirt sleeves in the middle of winter. <laughs> so that was, and also we stayed uh, in the, I think it was the New York Giants baseball, one of the New York teams in there uh, under the bleachers where they practiced their spring training. This was a... a quite a deal then, too. So, and uh, after we graduated, for some reason, they only sent uh, five of us, which was the two pilots, a navigator, radio operator, and me, to Savannah, Georgia. We picked up a brand new airplane and uh, started up the coast to fly it over for a replacement. Can, and I, can we go back to your training just a okay. little bit before you pick up a new airplane? Talk to me about a, the typical training day. What what time did you get up? Uh, obviously, it make a difference whether it's day or night yeah. mission, but what time did you get up? How long did it take to get the airplane ready? Uh, those kinds of things. Well, uh, I, you know, I really don't remember. Uh, um, we didn't, the biggest part for me was to go around, of course, and with the pilot, inspect the tires and so forth. and. Uh, one thing on the old radial engines, I don't know if anybody remembers this or not, but they had a big old cylinder on the bottom of there, and that thing tended to collect oil. So you had to go through there and take the prop, push the prop through three or four times to get the oil out of there. Otherwise, it would lock up. And we had to all do that. And uh, really, uh, I think we was out probably maybe four hours at a training session. And uh, and what you were you were tail gunner? No, I was a. I sat, gunner? I stood right between the pilots, or right yeah, behind them, because I was supposed to help monitor the gauges and so forth to make sure that uh, if they were busy doing something else, watch the cylinder head temperatures and things like this, so to make sure everything was going and assist those, and just man the top gun, which was right behind me then. Okay. And uh, so. That was my biggest duties on there. And also fill out the log sheet for the <clears throat> airplane, how many hours we flew, who flew it, all, had a list of all the crew members' names, members' names, and so forth. And that's about it. I can't remember what else. I think that when we was down on the ground, we took a look at some ground school about 
surviving if we got shot down, what, uh, how to uh, conduct ourselves and so forth. And, and uh, the habits of the Americans versus the European people. And a couple instances I remember is one thing that uh, most Americans, especially right-handed people, will cut their meat and eat with their right hand. Where the German, I mean, there are some, you know, they'll cut with a knife, but they use the fork. And this is one thing I said, if you happen to be someplace in a place where the, the Gestapo or something is looking at you, this is what you had to remember. And I remember they give us, uh, they, they took pictures like this with a civilian suit on and everything and give us a card a packet that had a bunch of inf uh, maps for one thing and then uh, like a passport in case you got down, maybe you could fake your way that you was a civilian. <laughs> your German was good enough for that, yeah. huh? Well, I, I, my folks were German. That's another thing that was kind of ironic. My mother and her and her mother used to speak German over the telephone before the war started, but when it started, <laughs> they had to quit that right away. And uh, also my dad had fought in World War One too. He had he had uh, been in the service, so uh, I diverted your your yeah. storyline. Well, uh, to I, I was trying to get just a little of the flavor of your training. Did you fly every day or every other day? Uh, or? I'm sure that we flew probably at least every day. Okay. I'm sure because uh, they needed you to get trained and get over there and get replacing the people you know that were getting sure. shot down. And so, how many? How long were you at MacDill then in this I, uh, I'm saying live training, if you will, live Probably ammunition. three months. Okay, and you're, you use live ammunition? Yes. Drop live bombs or no, practice bombs? Uh, yes, I think we did, you know. I, didn't, I never thought about that. I'm sure we did because uh, they had the bombardier had a practice just like the rest of us. And we didn't shoot it. I think we, uh, we didn't shoot at anything really down there. When we was in uh, gunnery training out in Arizona, uh, we rode around on the back of a old truck, and they had a turret mounted on it, and they had shotguns on there, and that's what we practiced shooting, practiced uh, shooting at a moving target, you know. And we didn't really use 50 caliber till we got down to uh, Florida. We would fly out over the ocean or the bay or whatever it was, and you'd just shoot out there so you wouldn't be bothering anybody. You didn't have a tow target on another airplane not, or anything like that? Not at that time, no, yeah. we didn't. Uh, of course, the war was kind of winding down then, too, and maybe they didn't feel, you know, that was necessary anymore. But uh, So after, after MacDill, then, your crew was sent to pick up a brand new airplane? Yes. And, and where did you pick up the airplane? We plane picked it up at Savannah, Georgia. Okay. And when we was flying up the coast, I still remember, and I don't know why they allowed this, I guess, but we flew, and I still remember looking down and seeing the Pentagon when we flew over Washington, or around Washington, pretty close. And uh, like I said, we landed uh, up in uh, Labrador, I think it was, and uh, sat there overnight. We took out for England via Greenland and the weather turned bad and we turned us back and we went back into Maine someplace and uh, spent about three days till the weather cleared. Mm -hmm. Then they sent us back, I think, I think this was in Newfoundland this time, overnight and then instead of going Greenland while well, we flew straight across the ocean to the Azores. And I still remember, boy, I hope all four of them engines keep right on a turning because that was over, to me, that was a big expanse of ocean. And when the Azores appeared, you know, it was just like in a picture postcard. It was green and it had the rock fences and so forth around there, and it really looked beautiful. <laughs> and another little incident there when we was refueling, I was supervising getting putting gas back in the plane. And, and at that time, on the B-17, they had added two tanks on the extreme out edges of the wings. They called them Tokyo tanks because they had to use them in the South Pacific to reach long distance. And we didn't, of course, need them at that time. And uh, we had, and I told that old boy, I didn't know how far it was, you know, to the next place. And I said, well, aren't you going to film a Tokyo tanks? And he says, oh, you won't need those. But he says, I'll give you a little bit if you want some. And he did. <laughs> well, we flew just to Marrakech. And that wasn't very far, you know, and spent the night. And I remember it was either there or Tunis. The next night was Tunis. We slept on 
mattress that had straw in it. <laughs> and I don't remember what the facilities were or anything. It had to be some kind of a U.S. base, I imagine. This was in Tunis? Tunis, Africa, okay. North Africa. And what, 1940? Well, this would have been, uh, let's see, 43, 44, 45. And uh, from Tunis, then we flew to Berry, Italy, and this was the pool where we left the airplane. And then they flew us to Foggia, which was our air base. And uh, we was living there in tents out in an orchard. I remember that, and we stayed out in an orchard. And some, uh, uh, I had inherited somebody's cot and blankets and everything else. I remember that. And... Uh, from there, uh, the first mission that I flew, they were smart enough not to send us as our own crew. They sent us with an experienced bunch. Each one of us flew with another experience. And how much time have I got left? Can I talk? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, what kind of tickled me after I realized it, that I flew as a waste gunner that day, the first mission. And when we got up pretty close to where the target was, I noticed that the old boy on the other side, we had flak jackets we put on. And on the side windows, there was a quarter-inch piece of steel down there to keep, you know, protect you a little bit from bullets. <laughs> and here I noticed he was curled up onto that, on that flak suit, and pulled it up and between his legs and laying. I said, what are you doing? I'm looking out the window, you know, see what's going on. He said, if you want to get back on one, you better do like I'm doing. <laughs> well, I realized then, you know, we had still had flak, but we didn't have any fighters at that time. That was all... We they ruined it enough, shot enough of them down that we didn't have any fighter planes. So I done like he told me, and then on the next one, while we flew as our own crew, I then I learned a little bit more about what was going on, you know. And when we got down on the second time, that was uh, then the war was over, and and so we didn't have to fly any more missions. So you flew two missions. Yeah, that's all I had to fly. <laughs> and those were both out of. Foggia Air Force Base okay. in Italy. Northern Italy. Yeah. Well, this was down right where the spur of the boot is. Okay. If you remember, there's a little protrusion, they always call that the spur. And this is where that was. And then we shared that airfield with uh, another group and with an English group, too. That flew out of there. The English would fly at night because they uh, didn't have any escorts or anything else, and the Americans would fly in the daytime out of England and also out of Italy. But by this time, you really didn't need the escorts no. because there were no enemy fighters. Uh. That's correct, and that's another interesting thing. Uh, you've heard about the Tuskegee Airmen, the black mm -hmm. pilots. Yep. Okay, they was down in our neck of the woods, yeah. and they flew our escort for us. I can still see them red-tailed Mustangs out there flying along for us. So uh, that was something, too. And uh, then after that, of course, all the boys that was over there that had uh, was over there for quite a while, uh, got to come home, so we stayed behind and uh, kept the airplanes up in shape. We would start them up ever, I mean, so many every day, make sure they was all operable. And other than that, we didn't really didn't have too much to do. And then, of course, when our time was up, I, uh, that's another funny incident. <laughs> I've got, we all, a bunch of us went over to Naples, Italy. That was where we was going to disembark. And everybody was getting called in to get up and get stuff in order, and they didn't call me. And so I finally went and asked. And he said, oh, you got another month to go yet. They made a mistake. <laughs> back to my outfit I went. Well, I didn't tell anybody I went back. I just got my old bunk back, and I was laying there. And at that time, we was flying the infantry guys up to Rome for rest leave. We'd fly a bunch of them up there, and we'd spend eat lunch and so forth, and fly back in the afternoon. And about the second trip, I climbed out of the airplane, and <laughs> the old engineering officer was standing there, and he said, is your name Hetzler? And I said, yeah, and he said, where in the H have you been? He says, I knew you was back here, but I never didn't know where you were. <laughs> I was just flying along, just free of charge with them guys. So anyway, he said, well, from now on, you're the, you're the crew chief of this airplane. So I'd only spent about a month, and then my time was ready to go. And this time we went to Leghorn, Italy, which was up further up the boot. And disappeared there and got on the Pomona Victory ship and came on home. And that's about the extent I remember. Uh, 
They always told me, you know, that old ocean looked just like glass, you know, and I wouldn't believe it, and I did see that one day, by golly, and experience just looked like you get out and walk right on it. And uh, one day we got, we woke up, and there wasn't, the engines wasn't turning or anything else. They broke down or something, and <laughs> so we had all kinds of experiences coming back. I remember coming into New York Harbor and going past the Statue of Liberty, and uh, we went into uh, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, I think it was. Well, there's five of us decided we was going to go into New York City that night, and we went up to Times Square, I remember that, and we went into a restaurant, and I had strawberry pie. Oh, boy, I just couldn't believe it, you know, <laughs> after eating army food all that time. And my buddy from Wichita and me, we both bought a shirt and a pair of pants ready, so when we was out, we was going to be in civvies right away. <laughs> And uh, then we put us on a train, we come back to Fort Riley, I mean to Fort Leavenworth, and that's where we were discharged. And I was telling in there that uh, I came out, my buddy came out and says, well, did you enlist in the reserves in case you have war or it starts up, you can get your own rate back? I says, no. So I went back in and reassigned and signed up. And I Came on home, and let's see, I got discharged in June, and in August, why, my girlfriend and me got married, and uh, let's see, then I worked out at Fort Riley for a little while. What did you do at Fort and, Riley? Well, my cousin was out there uh, pressing clothes, and uh, he had been in the Navy for a long time. He had enlisted in the Navy early. And he decided he was going to go to artist school. So I went out and applied for his position, and I got that. And uh, after I was there, there was a, another wise person in there. I mean, he said, well, you ought to take advantage of the GI Bill, you know, and learn of something. And I thought, well, I like airplanes and mechanics, so I'll go to uh, uh, civilian school. So you're licensed. You, you had to have a license to work on civilian airplanes, you know. So I went to Tulsa. Oklahoma and went to school for a year and got my uh, license to work on airplanes. I had six months left on my GI Bill, so then I went and uh, learned to fly and even got up and got a commercial pilot's license. And by well, that time, the wife and I decided big cities wasn't for us, and we come back to Manhattan and uh, went to work at Marshall Air Force Base at that time. They had an opening. And I don't know, I hadn't worked there very long, and then the government decided they didn't need all these bases, so they started closing them up. Well, we either had to go to, like, Lincoln, Nebraska, or Kansas City, some other big city, and we decided we didn't want any of that. And I fooled around a little bit, and uh, my older brother had been over to Junction City and uh, had applied for the post office. And I thought, well, that sounds like a pretty good job. So I went down and asked. Well, they didn't have any openings, but they put my name on. And uh, I guess I was home one night when this big old deep voice called on the telephone, and he said, well, I hear you're looking for a job or something like that. And I thought, or he said, this is a postal contractor. And, of course, I got all excited. <laughs> And what it was, it was a guy hauling the mail from the post office to the train and back again, you know. And, and I wasn't working at the time, so I accepted that job. And one day the assistant postmaster came out, and he said, you still interested in coming to work? And I said, yes. So he said, okay, he said, come in, we'll sign you up. Well, I'd been there, I can't remember what it was. It wasn't very maybe three months and uh, all at once I got this big manila envelope in the mail registered from the War Department. And I opened it up and he <laughs> said, we're going to send you to Cheyenne, Wyoming to get your affairs in order. We're going to have to put you back in the Korean War. And uh, so I went up there and we uh, was on, I don't know, we spent a couple of days and got interviewed and everything. And he called us out, and he said, well, I'm going to give you 20 more days to go home, get your affairs in order, and report to Selfridge Base in Michigan. I thought, oh, boy. And uh, we went back in the barracks, and that afternoon they called us out again, and they said, well, we got enough volunteers and everything. We don't need you anymore. We're going to send you back home. So, 
That was how close I came to being in the Korean War. And uh, that's about it. I come back and uh, work for the next 30 years in the post office right here in Manhattan and retired in 1980 and just been about a, that's about it. Why don't you pick your uh, your board up there oh. with your awards and uh, decks and Ray if you may have to move the camera just a little bit or we'll have to there may be a glare or something if we need to tip it. Tell us about uh, you've got some uh, badges there to top. Tell us what those are for. Well, one of them <coughs> One of them, of course, is the Good Conduct Medal, and no, uh, I'm talking about the the uh, the shoulder patches there. Oh, yeah. One of them is the Second Air Force, which I was in uh, when we were in here in the States when we was training. Okay. And then the fifteenth was the one that was over in Italy. It started in North Africa and went up into Italy and so forth. And your aviation badge there, then. That was a, that's what they call a gunner's. Or wings that you got the pilots and the bombardiers all got different symbols. They didn't have any for a mechanic, and at that time we didn't have flight engineers, so uh, I uh, had a gunner's wings. And the other banner, just uh, uh, one of them is uh, the European theater where we were, and the victory medals there, and uh, and uh, the. the Pole Valley, I think, is one of them where we, it was one that, for Italy when we was in that. And that's about it. It wasn't anything spectacular like the, for bravery or anything, but they were what we served as. No, but one that's in the middle there above your, your name tag is, is one of the famous ones, right? Oh. So right here. <laughs> yeah, that's the old ruptured duck, they call yeah. it. <laughs> While we yeah. have that, it's a good opportunity to talk about it because okay. it's, you see a, in literature quite often, but yeah, it, it it was just something that you put into the belly of your suit to tell everybody that you had served in the service. So, and why we weren't smart enough when we were that age to keep all that stuff, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I did have my uniform for quite a while, <clears throat> and I had joined the Civil Air Patrol out here. They had a branch, and they wanted uh, guys, but. Uh, uh, that didn't last very long, really. There was too much involved for me, and I wasn't didn't have enough experience. And so, uh, and I can't remember. I think one thing that was the flood of '51 took a lot of that stuff. And the fact I had a lot of pictures that all went down the river when that came through, because we just had them parked at my parents' house at 419 Thurston, and that's where the water came clear up on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> So. Well, uh, you spent 30 years here with the post office, yeah. approximately, mm -hmm. and uh, tell us uh, about your family. Uh, you, you mentioned your wife. Well, we had four boys uh, when we lived here, and uh, the, well, our, our third boy, Bruce, we lost with leukemia when he was 12 years old. The uh, other boys, uh, oldest one, he married a farmer's daughter down in uh, southern Kansas and went farming for it with his daddy-in-law and, uh, and he couldn't quite get along so evidently he come back to Manhattan and uh, was picking up odd jobs and so forth and he finally got into trucking, bought his own truck and uh, done some trucking and his wife went into uh, some kind of financial business like selling mutuals and so forth. So, and then our second son was, he works for United Parcel Service, and he's been with them for 15 or 16 years. And our youngest, uh, he graduated up here in, in air, air, uh, air conditioning, so forth, and went to Wichita, but he didn't like it very well down there, and he finally Went to work for uh, Erickson Corporation, which was telecommunications, and uh, he's up in Nebraska now. So, how about grandkids? Well, we just have four. We got the oldest boy has two granddaughters or two daughters, and the uh, second boy just had a boy, and the youngest just has one daughter. So that's, uh, and none of them are married, so we don't have any great grandkids. 
<laughs> uh, as we uh, kind of finish up here, is there any anything that you'd like to, uh, any highlight that you think of that you'd like to tell us about? Well, not really. I say, oh, it said I was, I guess, really grateful for the experience of doing all this, and uh, but I wasn't the one to do it again. <laughs> but I really was. I mean, this is something for somebody that never been out of the state of Kansas to get to go to these different states and also overseas at that time you know that was that was quite an experience for a young person and like I was telling Bobby in there that uh, I can't believe here we were 18 20 years old doing this stuff especially them guys flying the airplanes and so forth and learning all about navigation and all of this and uh, I would be scared to death to ride with them now but <laughs> but at that time we didn't think about it and uh, <laughs> it's it was it was a good experience and that's about all I really got to say about it I guess well, we thank you for all the things that you did and we thank you for coming in this morning and uh, and helping us with this project well, I'm thankful myself to do it. Okay. Very good.